Hey, everybody. Uh, happy Wednesday. So it's the day before Thanksgiving and uh, Jennifer's out shopping. And I just said, you know what? I would be glad just to do tonight's service. And I thought this would be fun. I want to share with you how I do a word study. Uh, we've been going through spiritual gifts and looking at different spiritual gifts. And uh, I thought I would just let you in on uh, my study process. You know, the goal for me as a pastor is not to have secret knowledge that you have to come to me to get, or otherwise you won't find God. The ultimate goal is for you to be able to do whatever I can do. Uh, obviously, we bring our own giftings and talents to the equation, but uh, I would encourage you, if you ever wanted to develop a skill when it comes to Bible study, uh, doing word studies is a wonderful skill to develop. Uh, it helps me greatly. So with that, we're going to continue through spiritual gifts. I, I've been following a form that orders the spiritual gifts, not in, particular, in any particular order, but just um, been going through that list. And last uh, Wednesday, we talked about uh, healing, the gift of healing, and that was a fascinating discussion, and I'd encourage you to listen to that if you haven't. Uh, but this week, we're going to talk about an interesting phrase that I actually think doesn't really open up until you take a deeper look into the words. And uh, it's the phrase, uh, workings of miracles, or gifts of miracles, or something like that. So with that, uh, I want us to go look at uh, a source that I use to do word studies. And what we're going to do is discover what the word means together. I've already gone through this, so I'm not just doing my homework with you as a cheap way to do less. But I've actually gone through this already. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of take you through what I've gone through and see if we can discover uh, something together. So with that, I'm gonna pull up uh, the site that I use often. And so I'm going to be uh, a lot of the time in the tiny box in the corner today. But here we have uh, the website biblehub.com is one I use quite a bit. Now you don't have to use this. Uh, I'm sure you can find other sites as well. And there are other sites, but what I like about biblehub.com is one, uh, I don't find a lot of advertising on it. I, I use Bible Gateway sometimes to find scripture, and it just drives me crazy. Uh, all the advertising on it, and also some of the advertising that I think is just uh, repulsive, the kinds of things they're advertising. That's the world we live in, right? You're reading scripture, and on the right, you got some sort of far-right partisan post trying to get you to click on that. But regardless, I like Bible Hub because I haven't found much advertising on it, and also because it really has a lot of resources and it's all free. So first, uh, we're going to look at uh, the scripture where this Gifts of Miracles comes from. Now, if you look here, uh, right now we are in the section which is called the parallel section. You look to the far left there, there's parallel, then sermons, then topical, then strongs, comments, interlinear. I'm going to go through some of those, but we're in the parallel section. And the parallel section basically just shows you the scripture uh, that you're researching in different versions. So here's 1 Corinthians 12, 10, and uh, here it is in the New International Version. <clears throat> it's talking about gifts. Now, this is one of those verses where it's cut, you know, the sentence is cut right in the middle. And if you wanted to go, let's say, uh, to the verse before that, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 10, you just click and uh, it'll take you to 1 Corinthians 12, 9 and you can work your way that way. You can also look at the full chapter if you want, but let's just go to 1 Corinthians 12, 10. So the New International Version says, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. So these gifts are given to people according to a measure of grace, and Paul is lifting, listing uh, the gifts. We talked about um, the concept of to one is given the gift of healing, and he has to another miraculous powers. In fact, let me let me see if that's correct. Uh, yeah, so 1 Corinthians 12, 9, uh, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit. So Paul goes from gifts of healing by that one spirit uh, to this gifting uh, to another miraculous powers. And so this is kind of confusing when you read it, because you go, uh, gifts of healing seems to be a specific gift, and then another miraculous powers, that seems kind of vague. Uh, so one way to study a word is to see how different uh, Bible translators translate it. So the New Living Translation says this, 
he gives one person the power to perform miracles. The English Standard Version says, to another, the working of miracles. Berean is similar, working of miracles. And you'll find that some versions are very similar and some are not as similar. The New American Standard Bible, which I've been using uh, recently in our church, and to another, the effecting of miracles. King James Version, to another, the working of miracles. Uh, Christian Standard Bible, performing of miracles. Contemporary English Version. Uh, or the power to work mighty miracles. Now that's interesting. The word power is used here. And as we go on, you'll also, as you do your own word study, see why they chose certain words here. Good news translation, the spirit gives one person the power to work miracles. Let's see if there's any other ones of note here. Don't get dizzy as I'm scrolling here. Uh, affecting of miracles, working of miracles. So pretty similar translations on all these. Oh, here's one, the Weymouth New Testament, to another, the exercise of miraculous powers. So the emphasis is not the miracles, the emphasis is powers. So you could read this and go, well, why did they emphasize powers versus miracles? The Young's literal translation and says, to another in working of mighty deeds. So that's a little different. And miracles. All right, so we're going to go up to the top here, and I'll show you how I can get into this a little deeper. So that's the parallel uh, part. Now, if you go to the next one, sermons, you can find sermons that are written on 1 Corinthians 12, 10. I would encourage you don't go there first, uh, because already now you're getting somebody else's view of that scripture. You first want to come to your own view. Uh, there's a topical presentation. Here's the Strong's number. I'm going to get into what the Strong's number is. But what I like to do is go to the interlinear uh, translation. Now, interlinear is basically you have the English and then you have the Greek underneath it, or the Greek and the English underneath it. We'll, we'll check to see which it is. Okay. So here is the interlinear version of Corinthians. And so you'll see how uh, this is written in the Greek and then the English translation below it. So... Uh, and you don't have to know Greek, right, to be able to do this. So what you can do is just look for to another now working of miracles. So those are the two phrases, working and of miracles. So uh, miracles here, uh, if you see it, it's dynamion is the actual word, dynamion. So uh, in fact, we get dynamite from that word. So uh, here's a couple ways you can do this. You can click from here if you want. And uh, right up here, you see the number that says 411. That is a number for Strong's Concordance. And that goes way back to, there used to be a book, Strong Concordance. Most of this is all in digital form now. But each uh, Greek word would have a specific number and you could look up that number. Often you would look for an English word and uh, what it was translated in the Greek. And then you look at the Greek number and you click on it. But I wanna show you something else. So you could go from there and click on that. And just from this section, you can start doing a word study. But here's another uh, way to see this. That was the interlinear. Uh, here's just the Greek. But uh, now the Greek section here doesn't help you as much in the order of things, but it's also gonna help you with this. So uh, here's the Greek word, here's the English word, Morphology, that's if you know the construct of the verb or the noun and those sorts of things. And now you're getting into the weeds here. Uh, but over here you see Strong's number. So let's go to miracles. There's miracles. Dynamion is the word, dynamion. And so uh, here's the Strong's concordance. So let's click on that. So we click on Strong's concordance. And this is going to give us a bunch of biblical concordances uh, that show us what the word means. So on the left here, Strong's Concordance, uh, dunamis is where it ultimately comes from, uh, dunamis. So um, let's see, you don't need to know the noun, the feminine, all that stuff, but the definition below there, here's the different definitions for dunamis. Power, might, strength. Now right there, that might get you, you say, well, it's translated miracles, but here, the strong says it's power, might, and strength. Now, you could just stop with Strong's Concordance and say, okay, I'm just going to give the definition from the dictionary. 
But Strong's came up with a definition based on doing word studies, that they looked at every place in the New Testament that this word was listed, and they looked at how it was used in its context. They also would look at how it was used during that time in other literature, also how it was used in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Old Testament translated into Greek. So they're able to see uh, the Greek words that were used to replace Hebrew in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. I'd be, they'd be able to see if the New Testament writers were using a similar term to reference uh, the Septuagint if they had a Greek Old Testament. But the main way that you do a word study, particularly if the word is, is found a lot in the scripture, is you just find all the scriptures that have the word and you begin to read them. But before we do that, let's look at some of the other listings here. So uh, Strong says this can be used as physical power, force, might, ability, efficacy, energy, meaning. Uh, plural can be powerful deeds, deeds showing physical power, marvelous works. Now already, this is probably showing you that a scripture that says workings of miracles means a lot more than just um, miraculous things happening. The word itself here implies how it's happening. The term power is not necessarily the outcome. The power is how the outcome occurs. Uh, <clears throat> we'll go on to helps word studies. Here's another word study that they have. Um, if you go down to the NAS exhaustive concordance, again, it gives you the definition, miraculous power, might, strength, NASB translates it this way, <coughs> ability, meaning, mightily, might, miracle, miracles. And this gives you how many times it's translated these different ways. So four times in the NASB, it's translated ability, one time meaning, one time mightily, 17 times miracles, three times miraculous powers, 83 times the word is translated power. So this is what opens up this word study to me. Although it's translated as miracles in this section, most of the time in the New Testament, this word is translated powers. A Thayer's Greek lexicon gives you some more information. So strength, ability, power, uh, universally, look at A there, it says inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So that's even outside of the New Testament. Inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So. A lion has a certain amount of power. Um, I don't think they had dynamite, but dynamite has a certain amount of power, right? So in that sense, the word could just be the power that is needed or the power that something demonstrates. I have a certain amount of physical power as a human being. I have a certain amount of intellectual power. It's inherent in me. And so now if we look at that, there's a gift of power, which a gift of power would seem to imply that it's a power greater than the power that is inherently in me. So this little definition here, I really like. If dunamis is normally uh, talked about in terms of inherent power, the inherent power of something, a gift of power would be a gift that goes beyond our inherent power. I mean, it also could imply that our inherent power <laughs> is also a gift from God. So I'm sorry, I keep coughing. <coughs> so, and then here's some references that it gives to how it's used uh, universally. Then it gives some other definitions. See, you can really start studying. And this is just the commentaries. But again, I would encourage you not to just go to the commentaries. Although these commentaries will help you show Will show you where they get the information. Here's another uh, B, you have A, B. It can also mean specifically the power of performing miracles. And it gives you references as well. C, moral power and excellence of soul and where that's used. Uh, the power and influence which belongs to riches. E, power and resources arising from numbers. And you see these categories that they developed, A, B, C, D, and E, and then the scriptures next to them. Well, what have they done? They've read all the scriptures, that have this word in them, and then they've taken those scriptures and put them into categories. And from those categories, they'll be, oh, it's, it seems to be used this way in this category. Uh, when it's used this way, that's another category. They're able to come up with their own word study, and you're able to do that as well. See, look, at this just goes on and on. It's a great resource that these are all in one place. This is biblehub.com. Now, if you look on the right here, and I'm sorry for, don't make you seasick by scrolling here, 
reminds me of the old days when I would look through microfish at the library. That dates me, but man, I would get seasick looking through microfish. Uh, but here we have on the right here is every scripture that contains this word. So you see it's used in Matthew 6, 13. And this is where let's, we're just going to do a quick word study in this sense. And I'm not even going to click on these because you can click on these and find the whole sentence. But let's just look at how it's used. It's translated in Matthew 6, 13 and the power. Uh, Matthew 7, 22, performing many miracles, uh, uh, done many wonderful works. So it's used for Jesus as he did many works, many powerful works, many powerful miracles. So that's the word that is used to describe the mighty works of Jesus. He did these powerful things. And so we call it miracles, but it's not just, you know, it's interesting, a miracle doesn't necessarily tell you uh, what energy is behind it, but the word itself implies the energy that Jesus had power. And this power performed healings, and this power helped him speak, and this power gave him dominion, and that the exercise of these amazing things of people being healed, fed, you know, all, all those miracles are an expression of his power. Matthew eleven twenty two. 22, most of his miracles were done. Uh, K, KJV's, uh, King James Version is, uh, his mighty works were done. So again, mighty works, the, the power, I love mighty works because mighty works says these are powerful works. There's, there's something in him that is coming forth that is changing the world. When he speaks, there's a power behind his words. The problem to me with just saying miracles is it could be, he just has normal words and somehow miracles happen. Or he does certain rituals and miracles happen based on the rituals. But the miracles don't happen based on the rituals. The miracles don't happen based on the carefulness of the words. The miracles happen because he is empowered, right? The Holy Spirit has empowered Jesus to do these works these miracles. Matthew eleven twenty one, 21, for if the miracles that had occurred in you, this is where he's rebuking, and some of you can find these scriptures, you know, where if these mighty miracles or these mighty works or if these powerful expressions of God's kingdom had occurred in other places, basically saying you have not received these miracles. I think, let me actually check out, click on this one. I think I can get to it. So, uh, what, what verse was that? This is one of the problems when I'll go back and forth here. Let me go back. So that's uh, Matthew eleven twenty one. 21. So if I click on this scripture, it takes me to all of Matthew 11. And then we'll go to 21. And here he is. Jesus is saying, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles, now that word miracles, if the power that came through me, if the the works that had come through me, if if others had seen this power, if it had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, uh, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So that gives you the context of how the word is used. We'll go on a little bit more here. Repeatedly, though, in the works of Jesus, this word, which is translated miracles, uh, often is mighty works miraculous powers. It's just in Matthew. You can see how it's used over and over again to talk about uh, Jesus um, doing miracles. Uh, in Mark 5.30, um, here, here's a perfect example. Let's say Mark, Mark 5.30. This is in the NASB. So let's click on that. Mark 5.30. Here's Mark 5. Let's go to 30. Uh, immediately, Jesus perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garment? So this is a perfect example of why it's good to know where this word comes from. So this is the story of the woman with the issue of blood coming up to Jesus in this mighty crowd. She touches the hem of his garment and even the hem of their garment, they had these little prayer tassels. She touches those prayer tassels, believing she's going to be healed she is healed, and Jesus basically says, who touched me? Uh, there's power that has flown out of me. Like, he recognizes that the power that he has has been has basically moved from him 
into someone else. And so this tells you so much more about miracles, that the miracle isn't just that she's healed, but she's healed because Jesus is empowered to heal. And there's this power encounter. And sometimes we don't like those terms, power encounter. That sounds kind of weird. But that is what any miracle is. It's the flow of power. It's an empowerment. It's God's power moving in you. So uh, let's go back to this, see if any others. Now, we could spend hours on this, right? Because there's so many scriptures here. But see how as the more scriptures you click on, the more you see the usage. Now, if you wanted to do a big word study, you would do every single one of these scriptures, and then you would summarize it. Okay, that was uh, the word used in a, in a form where it's about a, a power or a force going through Jesus. Um, here, it's an expression of a miracle that he has done. Here's an expression. Of, and then as you begin to put in these categories, you can start making your own ideas that the word dunamis is used in this context. It's used for power encounters. It's used for miracles. It's used for the mighty works of God. Let's let's get out of the Gospels here. So if you need to close your eyes with all this uh, surfing here. But let's see here. So it gives that there are 120 Greek occurrences. And then here's the different versions of the occurrences. It can be used uh, in this version, in that version. These are all uh, same versions of the word here. So a couple other things I want to show you here is, because uh, I just want to, I don't want to go too long on this, uh, is, so we just looked at the interlinear. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back here and take you back to the beginning. Here was the Greek version. Here was the original word. So you see in the beginning here, there's so many ways that you could look at this scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 20. There's sermons on it. Uh, there's the Strong's concordance on it. Uh, commentaries. Now, these are parallel commentaries. Now, <clears throat> this is what I would warn you with this, that a lot of sites have commentaries, and I'll just click on this, of what different commentaries say about, these are all the different commentaries they have listed. These commentaries are in general all public domain. And so often they're older commentaries, and not that older is worse, but they're public domain, older commentaries, that, that some of them just aren't that good. They're okay. They're a guy, a pastor, a famous leader who wrote stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they really have the context of what the scripture says. But what's nice is, let's say, after you did a word study, and you're like, this really seems to be what power means or what this Greek word means, then you can come back to these commentaries and you can read what they say. Uh, and you can find, uh, now this commentary is on the whole verse, so it's not just on uh, the working of power, but you can begin to see if these commentaries match what you found. And what you'll find is sometimes you found what they found and it confirms it and you get excited. Other times you'll find that they view it differently than you. And you might say, well, they didn't do a very good word study or you find that maybe they have some uh, of their own biases. Like, so for instance, here's Benson's commentary. I don't know who Benson is, uh, but to another, the working of miracles. Now, this is what he says. That is miracles of a different kind, such as taking up serpents, drinking any deadly drought with a, without a hurt, and especially casting out devils. But it may not be improper to observe here that the original expression uh, here rendered the working of miracles, is translated by Dr. McKnight, the inworking of powers. Now, we know why he translates it, the inworking of powers, because that's what the word means in many places, powers. The former word being derived, uh, I'm just going to skip the Greek, not to make this hard for you, signifying not to work simply, but to work in another. Now, what you see in his first statement here is, I don't agree with Benson, where he says, uh, these are miracles of a different kind. That's where he's trying to make all these spiritual gifts in their own category. But the reality is, I don't think he's saying these are different miracles than the gift of healing. He's just focusing on, on a different thing. Before this, Paul said there are gifts of healing. Now he's saying something that's a broader category. There are gifts of empowerment. There's a gift of being given power. Power that you need to do what God has called you to do.
Uh, so you can, before I, we get into actually what I think this means, you can also, there's the Greek, there's lexicon, uh, there's different versions. You can do all those things there. So let me stop just a second here. And let's just think together, like as you've looked at all those things, how does the scripture open up to you? Well, to me, it opens up quite a bit because when I first read it, it just says gifts of miracles. And so that's kind of like, well, I guess if I pray, uh, miracles are going to happen. But if you look at the Greek and a word study of it, and you realize it's the gift of power. And the gift of power is incredibly important because it basically means this, that whatever God has called me to, he will empower me to do it. You see how different that is than just, well, I hope some miracles happen. It's that God will empower me. Uh, right now, I have the task of teaching a Wednesday night. I can believe that God will empower me to do this ministry, that there's a gift of power that will empower me to speak and to do what God wants me to do. God is, think about the task God has given you. This, this is what's so powerful about this scripture now, right? Uh, you know that, say, God has called you to talk with someone. God has called you to celebrate Thanksgiving in a certain manner. God will empower you to do that. God has called you to certain relationships, right? And then you could be like, I don't have the strength to put up with this person. Or, or let's say this in any relationship, right? Like, I, don't, I do not understand my wife, or I don't understand my kids, or my, my friend, or I don't understand myself that there's a limited amount of power in us, right? I do not have the mental capacity, the like mental capacity, emotional capacity. There's a limit. But what we believe is if God has called us to exist in this world, that he will empower my mind what, with what is necessary to be okay. He will empower my emotions with what is necessary to be okay. He will empower me to be able to abide with whoever he's entrusted to my care. You have a vocation. And you might think, man, I am just not good at this. <laughs> I'm not a people person. I'm not good at administration. I'm not good at organizing. I'm not good at working a 40-hour or 50-hour work week. You can trust that God has the gift of empowerment. He can empower you to do that. Isn't that exciting? Now, now you see how that opens up. I hope it's exciting because it excited me as I was looking through this. I thought, oh, wow. Before, it was just gifts of miracle, and I don't really know what to do with that. Like, okay, I'm glad there's miracles, but the gift of empowerment, the gift of power means that for whatever God has called us to, he can gift us with the power to do it. And also, I would say, as we've talked about natural and supernatural giftings, that whatever power I have within myself is a gift from God that should be used for God. Whatever strength I have, whatever intellectual or emotional capacity or physical capacity I have, it's a gift that should be used for God. So this is what I'll do with word studies. So you get excited, you kind of learn the word, you see it in the context, and then and then you start thinking, well, how does that apply to other scriptures? Maybe even other scriptures that don't necessarily use this word. And the thing that immediately came to me was the concept of uh, Paul saying that God's strength is made perfect in his weakness. So I want to I want to go to that because that's one of my favorite uh, scriptures. So let's pull that up and let's see if we can even search it. So I don't quite know where that's at. St strength made perfect. Oh, I don't see anything. Maybe it's all when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I am weak. Oh, there it is. I spelled weak wrong. Then I'm strong. Second Corinthians 12, 10. So. It brings it up there. 2 Corinthians 12.10. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, uh, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And then, again, you have some commentaries here. Uh, let's just look at it in the parallel here. Again, you could do a word study on this. He goes, in NIV, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to the vision and revelation from the Lord. 
I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Verse 7, or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Look in this version, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Looks like it's pretty similar in all these versions. So Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, isn't that cool? Christ's power. You know, let me see. That's probably a different form of power, but let's just see uh, what power, the word they use for power in that. And I don't know, I haven't done this. Um, oh, we got to go down a ways, don't we? What, what was the verse here? Um, it's 12.10. So let me go down to 12.10. Here's another way you can do that. So 12.10. And let's find... Oh, actually, uh, it's a similar word. When, then I'm strong, dunatos. Um, but I actually had the word power, didn't I miss that? Let me see where that is again. This is where you can get in the weeds. I'm getting in the weeds with you right now. Uh, let's go back to... So we'll go down to... The verse, keep me from boasting. And we'll go way down to the bottom here. Okay. So that is uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. So let's find that. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Uh, no, no, no. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. 2nd. You see my typing, Corinthians 12, 9. And then we will see that in the interlinear. And we will get to this. Well, there we go. Look at this. Dunamis, the same word. His grace is sufficient for me for his power is made perfect in my weakness. Now that's the same word that says we are given the gift of miracles. So isn't that exciting? This is one of my favorite verses and I've never noticed this connection. And I just learned something with you uh, that in this verse, 12, nine, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the same word that's used for working of miracles. So, so what is the gift that God gives us? He gives us power when we're weak. And, and that's such a promise, right? I hope you're following me on this. That's an exciting drum roll, right? It means that uh, if I'm weak, and even I've pleaded with the Lord, like, take away this weakness and give me what I need to make this, that God promises he will give us the gift of power, that he will be powerful. He will be powerful. He will be miraculously powerful when we're weak. He will be strong. That's good news. So after you look at that, you know, you look at how does it apply itself in your life? Well, it applies in so many ways, right? Uh, one, wherever I'm strength, thank you, Lord, for that miraculous power. Uh, but when I'm weak, and even after I pleaded with the Lord to take away that weakness, 
I can have confidence that he will be strong. He will be powerful. He will give me the gift of power. When I'm weak, he is strong. So I don't have to hide my weakness. I can celebrate it. The sun is shining through the window right now, as you can see. I love you guys. I hope, wow, look at this. Oh. <laughs> That's revelation right there. <laughs> so anyway, oh, let me see if I can get over here. Uh, good stuff, right? Let's just believe that revelation means we got to stop here. Lord, I thank you for the power that you've promised to give us, the gift of power, that you will do miracles through us where we are weak, you will be strong. I pray that for everyone this week and in the weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, that was kind of fun. All right. Love you guys. I'll talk to you later.